Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Nikolai Bogachikin. I'm a uh, journalist and managing editor of RT UK. And uh, before we start, I uh, think that I should uh, probably give you a uh, content warning uh, that um, what you're about to hear now and what you're about to be exposed to has been called uh, propaganda fake news and uh, foreign agents information. So uh, for those of you who are not that brave hearted, <laughs> uh, that, that was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, I've been asking myself the question, um, will some of the brightest thinkers in the UK already have made up their mind about RT? But I have come here today uh, to give a different perspective. And uh, all I would ask you is uh, that you listen and decide uh, for yourselves whether what I've said challenges or reinforces your preconceptions. Uh, indeed, I want to begin by discussing the willingness to listen and consider alternative uh, views. We are in an uh, online global society with more sources of information and news than ever before. And in uh, theory, we should be in a golden age of news one in which technology and uh, breadth of media enables us to better hear and understand uh, multiple views drawn from diverse sources. This should be truly exciting and positive, but uh, is it? It is very ironic that with many more outlets and ways to access content, we haven't seen a real diversity emerging in news. Instead, more confirmation of social biases and the same topics emerge again and again. The mainstream media has adapted not by broadening its horizons, but by falling into the trap of creating an ever deeper echo chamber. Whilst it is impossible to say whether the Huffington Post or the Guardian provides better coverage of global events, or indeed uh, the BBC or CNN, one thing is obvious, that the output from these outlets, old and new, is remarkably similar the same coverage of establishment views and opinions. If we are unable to hear views and stories from across the spectrum of society, how can we properly empathize with, with, uh, with each other? The consumer rightly looks to news outlets to curate items of interest for them. However, when the mainstream media serves up identical offerings, it becomes harder for people to actively engage with different perspectives in this new landscape. This is further exacerbated by online platforms such as Facebook. They serve up content that individuals like, confirming biases and restricting world news or uh, world views. And this is not the only issue. The echo chamber that has been created in the news has an effect of control also. Some commentators have argued that people are only allowed to see and respond to certain events in certain ways and that media spectators are both enabled and constrained by the technology of power that comprises today's mediascape. We, and a few others, believe that this echo chamber is a broken model. We believe that there are issues and voices on the sidelines that need to be heard, and that in order for us, for all of us, to have a complete picture of what's going on, whether in Britain or in other parts of the world, we need to go and seek out those voices and bring their stories, their views, to the public. It's in this space that we believe RT has an important role. Um, first of all, take, uh, let me take you back to the beginning of our journey when we, when we set up RT in uh, 2005, uh, because we didn't recognize our country on foreign channels or indeed in uh, foreign media in general. We felt that Russia was being misunderstood by the, wider, uh, by the wider world, and the coverage of Russia was based on stereotypes and reinforcement of long-held views. It was very hard to find a balance or fair perspective. This is what we set out to redress. However, over time, uh, our coverage has evolved beyond bringing Russia and Russian viewpoint to the world. As we witnessed the echo chamber that I described earlier, we recognized that there was another missing voice in the media, that of the alternative perspective. And, that, and from that insight, our network evolved 
and directly brought me to where I am now today. I'm responsible for the output uh, that we have on RTUK, and um, RTUK focuses on UK relevant uh, <coughs> content. Uh, it is created by UK journalists and is delivered to a uh, UK audience. We have the likes of uh, Afshin Ratanzi, who is hosting the Going Underground show. That's a topical political show uh, that examines uh, fresh and alternative uh, perspective on mainstream issues. We also have Max Kaiser, who was uh, once called the most uh, dangerous financial journalist on uh, television. And uh, of course, not to mention George Galloway and uh, Alex Salmond. Um, we cover stories that aren't covered by the mainstream and don't fit establishment narratives. Our international feed covers international issues first and foremost, and I can unequivocally state it does provide an alternative perspective, it questions views and opinions, and it offers a Russian view where it is relevant. We do not produce news, documentaries, articles, 360 degrees uh, videos, and a host of other content as a method, as a method of uh, coercion. We do it to bring valuable voices to the world, just like, uh, just as France 24, Deutsche Welle, and even the BBC unapologetically do, all invoking a national mission of some sort or other. When you look at the BBC's stated purpose to reflect the United Kingdom, its culture and values to the world, our mission of bringing a Russian perspective on international news to international audiences is hardly substantively different. But the desire to bring alternative opinions to the fore does make us different. And we're not claiming that our coverage is the only news source to watch or that our perspective is the only valid perspective to listen to. However, we are aware that this approach sets us against establishment and that some may argue that covering, us, uh, covering an unsavory issue or topic might exacerbate society's divisions, but that isn't why we should or shouldn't do it. <coughs> Should we really desire to live in a world where mainstream media has created perfect conditions for genuine concerns to be ignored, for unheard voices to be silenced? Even if you don't accept these arguments, what's more harmful is hearing a view that you may not agree with or not being allowed to hear it at all. As, Or uh, as Orwell put it, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. I'm not suggesting that this matter, uh, 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 that, this, uh, that this means you need to like our coverage, agree with it or solely watch us, but what does it really say for our ability to think critically if we dismiss alternative views before we listen to them? Unlike our media peers, we have never said don't watch BBC or CNN. We believe that you should watch them, that you should really watch the competitors, our competitors, and you should really read the Times or listen to LBC, but without watching RT, you cannot have the complete picture. Finally, if, uh, if all you desire to think is that RT equates to Russia's view, even then, it's surely worth hearing its point of view on the world, not ignoring it. We believe that the growth in news media should be a powerful and a positive tool to share different perspectives from across society. I challenge everyone uh, here today as to whether they truly listen and acknowledge different perspectives. As Einstein said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Arti believes this fully and we will continue to question more. Thank you for your time. Um, I look forward to your questions and um, I'm going to be joined by Anna Belkina, who is the uh, Arti's deputy editor-in-chief from Moscow and uh, she'll be able to address your more international uh, questions. Thank you very much. Nikolai, thank you very much for those uh, interesting opening remarks. I want to ask about the underpinning philosophy of RT because a lot of people talk about the issues of bias or about objectivity as there's something terms we all agree on. But lots of senior RT figures have said that there's no such thing as objectivity in the news, in media that there's no one standard of truth and objectivity. Um, what standard of evidence should journalists follow? And what do you understand objectivity to mean in the way that RT functions uh, in the UK? So, um, thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for having us. Um, 
I think that objectivity as, uh, um, as an ideal, uh, it's a wonderful thing. However, I think that it is uh, an unreachable, unattainable ideal because uh, at the end of the day, all news is made by journalists. And every journalist is first a person, a person uh, who brings his or her uh, perspective to any issue that he or she covers, uh, just by the way of looking at the world. It is all informed by our background, everything from our gender, race, uh, socioeconomic background, where we grew up, how we grew up, and that is inevitable. However, that is not a bad thing. In fact, that is a wonderful thing. And what we should be doing uh, instead of trying to figure out is getting giving 40% uh, to one side of the story versus 60% to the other, or the reverse, or is it 50-50? And what is the, um, you know, the, the perfect formula for any given issue is to embrace that diversity of perspectives to, um, as Nikolai said in his opening, to get a complete picture of the world, to listen to the American perspective from the likes of the VOA and the CNN, and the British perspective from the BBC, and uh, the Russian perspective or relevant or alternative perspectives when Russia has nothing to do with the story from the likes of RT. The foundation of our journalism is in facts-based journalism, and that, uh, we believe, should be the foundation of all legitimate, credible journalism for any news organization in the world. We do strive to bring balance. I think that is a much more, um, uh, first of all, attainable, but also a positive term when it comes to news issues. But uh, overall, what we try to do more is to complete the picture, not to repeat the same um, narratives and talking points uh, that are already well illustrated and well covered, but to add something new to the story because all stories are complex and they have different sides. And that is the only way that we can have a really deep and complete understanding of what is going on in the world today. I think the critique that you make of the echo chambers on mainstream news channels like BBC or Sky News is, is, has, a, has a lot of merit to it. But one concern that I have about the way that RT approaches to counter that is that do you not worry that by hosting figures on the margins of politics like George Galloway so frequently that you yourself encourage a different echo chamber to develop? That rather than going one beyond the BBC and having you know, these sort of figures in conversation with the mainstream, that by platforming people who have such a tendency to be on the margins of politics, you just create a new feedback loop and a new echo chamber for your viewers. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, um, <clears throat> I don't think that um, that we are that we are uh, encouraging people from the uh, from the uh, from the margins uh, uh, of the politics. That's that's uh, that's for for one. Uh, um, another thing is that. Um, who defines uh, again? Like who defines mainstream and margins? Yeah. So uh, whether we, <clears throat> so if we take uh, the BBC's well, uh, um, view of the world or Sky News' uh, view of the world, and we call it mainstream, that doesn't automatically uh, deny the right uh, to be heard to um, other people, you know. And uh, as um, uh, so, the the mainstream media has become. Um, over the years, it has become a very, how to say, a real bubble, you know, uh, that uh, in, uh, in our age of uh, internet, in our age of multiple news sources, um, quite a lot of people do not, uh, do not um, feel uh, that their views are adequately represented by, by these mainstream uh, stations, by, by big stations, yeah? So, uh, we are not. We are not. Uh, we are not. Uh, again, we are not uh, saying that uh, we would like to become the only voice, the mainstream voice. Yeah. So, call them marginalized uh, uh, politicians or, or not, but they have a followership. I mean, they these guys. Uh, they have people who listen to their opinions, who agree with them, and uh, we don't think that we are. It's it's in, it's in our right to be. Um, to be, how to say, to be saying that uh, these people have a right to be uh, their voice heard, and those people don't. So that's why we give uh, we give uh, a platform to to everybody who has uh, any voice in the public life of um, both the UK and the world. 
I'll actually add, uh, I'll add to that, that I think that there's a bit of a disconnect uh, between uh, what we've uh, been calling in kind of in the, in the discourse, um, um, uh, in the mainstream discourse of uh, marginal within the, just the media bubble versus kind of at large and what it means, what it represents. I think that uh, it's important to think back to 2016 and the uh, two major political events that happened, the, uh, the Brexit vote the, and the election of, uh, of President Trump in the United States. And the media, the big media story around both of those events was about um, how the media essentially missed the story and how the media has lost the trust of their public. And I think that uh, one of the reasons that uh, these things happened was because uh, the what we refer to as the mainstream media have set up the parameters of who is the, uh, you know, who is representing of their general public, who is their constituency, and everybody else is on their margin. So then uh, it becomes sort of a, a self-perpetuating kind of system that, uh, you know, you don't think these people are relevant, you don't think they're significant, Significant to the public discourse, while in fact they are representing huge swaths of uh, local uh, or national, international constituency that is just because it's not on your TV screen doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And that is exactly what we try to go and do and find those voices and uh, try to understand them, but also try to explain them to the world because just because you know, just because you, you ignore it or uh, don't cover it doesn't mean it ceases to exist. I think that's a really big lesson that we've learned. Yeah, and may I just add a little bit? Uh, so uh, uh, again, as, as Anna said, that um, the events in 2016, and obviously we understand that we are talking about Brexit uh, referendum and um, the uh, elections in the in uh, in uh, in America. So uh, these two major events, they they took they took the population by surprise, mostly. And I remember, uh, I, have, I have several friends uh, in, uh, in the British media so who, who work for, for BBC, for other broadcasters, and they were absolutely shocked, you know, so that, that morning when the results were, uh, were, uh, were announced, they said, uh, like all of them, uh, all of them were shocked. And the general, the, the general feeling was that, oh my gosh, we, it turns out we didn't know our country. We didn't know the people who live in our country, you know. So we didn't know. Uh, so everybody was so sure that the uh, that uh, uh, was so sure about the result of the referendum that uh, nobody even could imagine that uh, that um, mm, something uh, uh, some some other uh, outcome uh, can can happen. So, and it it clearly shows that uh, how much the media and uh, the journalists who work in the media uh, how much they. They uh, they have sometimes uh, lost the connect between between themselves and the rest of the country. When criticised for bias, RT spokespeople often highlight that the uh, network receives a similar number of Ofcom investigations and complaints as uh, other major broadcasters like Sky or BBC. Um, yet Ofcom has said that since the events in Salisbury uh, this spring, there's been a significant increase uh, in the number of investigations they've made into RT's reporting. Uh, compared to that of other networks. What explanation do you have for that change I in the number of Ofcom investigations you've been getting since the spring? So li on that, we literally, per Ofcom's own rules and regulations, cannot comment as uh, they are open. But I will say that when announcing those, Ofcom itself reiterated the point that uh, our record has been in line with other UK broadcasters. And uh, I think that that speaks for itself. I think what we have observed um, in the last uh, several months is the actions of the uh, British politicians, uh, public figures that have um, essentially tried to put uh, political pressure on the independent regulator due to political events that had absolutely nothing to do with RT. And I think that is uh, what should be alarming for really for everybody. Sure. There was obviously lots of uh, controversy surrounding the RT interview that was done with the uh, two men that the British government said were the uh, GRU operatives who committed this attack. Um, what sort of uh, concerns run through your run through the production team's mind before putting on an interview like that, where you know it's going to be such a uh, such a challenge with what everyone else in the British media are saying? Okay. Well, no, no, no. Um, I you know I wasn't uh, I wasn't present at, at the interview as uh, was not Nikolai. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, it, it did take place in Moscow. I think that uh, broadly and, um, you know, 
I generally, I'm not speaking personally for editor-in-chief of Margarita who uh, did, conducted the interview, but I think her aim was to, uh, to be a journalist first and foremost. Uh, obviously, this is a story that everybody, uh, everybody wanted. I think that uh, there isn't a news media outlet, whether Russian or British or anywhere else in the world, that have they gotten the phone call, have they had the opportunity, would turn down this opportunity. And um, she, uh, as she said numerous times since then, she asked the questions that uh, she wanted to ask. They were, um, I believe that they were probing questions. At the same time, the these two individuals, they put uh, as conditions for the interview quite a few, you know, quite a number of restrictions as well. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, the choice was, this is a matter of public interest. You can believe them, uh, you can not believe them. I think it was uh, quite clear from uh, even her own reaction during the interview that Margarita was quite skeptical um, about a lot of the answers. But um, at the end of the day, it's all a piece of a much bigger story that is a huge story for the international community. So picking up on that story, do you think RT receives more attention now as Russia begins to play a more assertive role in conflicts throughout the world? whether that's in Syria, whether that's in Eastern Europe. Is that why RT gains more attention? Because people in the West are more interested in Russia's mindset and Russia's politics? Or do you think it's just to do with Western phenomena and anti-establishment tendencies? I think it's uh, I think it's both, you know, it's yeah, uh, I, um, I agree that uh, that uh, uh, Russia has been uh, has been a major player uh, in um, in several several world um, uh, conflicts or like or areas of uh, interest uh, as of late, and uh, that's why, of course, um, Russian Russian viewpoint uh, to to these events uh, and uh, this, they they are they are they are valuable. And uh, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, again, yeah, that uh, the, the, uh, something that I would like to pick up on uh, from your answer is that is that uh, there is a sense and. Um, I don't know whether it's generally shared or not, but uh, there is a sense that uh, anti-establishment drive around the world feels greater uh, by the year. You know, and uh, it seems to me that uh, quite a lot of things that were happening, that have been happening in the uh, in global politics, in uh, in um, again take take the the Trump vote, and uh, so I I think that uh, quite a lot of it was because of uh, because of protest, because of anti-establishment protest. You know, so. We don't want to be uh, uh, to be uh, to be doing whatever we are we are told to do. So that's why we're gonna vote, and we're gonna vote against. Sure. One of the biggest sources of controversy in Russian foreign relations is the conflict in Ukraine, uh, with of course allegations of Russian involvement being uh, heavily refuted and denied by uh, the Russian Foreign Ministry. Um, I want to ask about how you handled that coverage because uh, several RT reporters resigned over that coverage. One. Well, one, one RT US anchor resigned on air, others resigned saying they had similar concerns. Do you think they had valid concerns about the coverage or do you think that they were completely, um, completely misunderstanding what was going on? Um, well, first of all, they are entitled to, uh, all of our reporters are entitled to their own opinions. In fact, I think in any, in whether it's the London newsroom you go or to the RDC newsroom or Moscow newsroom of any of the channel, you uh, will hear some rather fiery debates uh, around whatever news issues we're covering. And that translates to our coverage as well, where um, with you know, all the criticism that uh, Russia has received uh, on, on the, those issues, on Ukraine issue in particular, for instance, uh, whether it comes from Ukrainian side, whether it comes from uh, the US or UK side, you will find all of that uh, in RT coverage because uh, our own perspective only makes sense in a broader context. We do want to give a complete picture. So obviously we, uh, we address that. Um, you know, do we agree with their disagreement of how, you know, of how they saw the coverage? No, obviously we do not. And I think that you've seen, there have been uh, instances of uh, BBC staff leaving over the coverage of uh, Iraq War, Al Jazeera leaving something like 20 people over uh, coverage of various issues. The thing is, when it happens at RT, that becomes kind of a defining part of the story. It's something, you know, this happened four years ago, three, five years ago, 
and it becomes and it's brought up in almost every interview. It does not become part of the story for other for other channels. And I think that is something that's demonstrative more of the mainstream media treatment of and the just overall establishment discourse treatment of RT is this kind of outlier rather than a really um, objective uh, look at all the media and where basically these things happen and they happen everywhere. Are you surprised at how much RT has held out to be this outsider, this outlier, given that you know, Alex Salmond is the former first minister of Scotland, uh, George Galloway is a figure who wants a national following for his anti-war policies. Given the popularity of these figures and their previous electoral mandates, uh, are you surprised the extent to which the British media always regard RT as an outsider remote voice, given that as far as I think the, the, the ordinary observer can see, having someone like Alex Salmond giving a weekly show is hardly the, the, the epitome of outside radical challenge to the mainstream. I, I think this is very natural for for the mainstream um, for the mainstream media to be to be uh, to be doing this to us because uh, I mean I, it's, sometimes I, I I think that this is just a matter of jealousy you know so uh, because uh, I mean with uh, say you you brought up Alex Salman yeah uh, how many media in the world do you do you know who have uh, a former prime minister of a country like of a of a uh, not not the smallest country, you know. So, uh, like uh, uh, he was he was uh, uh, first minister of, of uh, Scotland, yeah. So how many how many media do you know who have uh, a politician with such a huge knowledge of uh, of uh, politics uh, to be their host, you know? So uh, of course they uh, uh, mainstream media probably probably they 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 fear. Um, they they realized over the past years that we can be successful, and uh, it is like a main how to say a main narrative, uh, main line that we've been hearing all over again and again that uh, oh, RT are I don't know like a bunch of uh, uh, marginalized uh, conspiracy theorists and all that stuff. Don't listen to them. So that's 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 what I was talking about. Like that's that's the desire to just kill. The diversity of opinions, without even like, without even, um, without uh, people trying to make up their minds, you know, because uh, say th that is the easiest way to uh, to how to say to kill a debate. When you when you don't want to uh, to listen to anything, you just say, oh, this guy is a uh, I don't know is a. Um, it's it's um, it's like um, say when you when you say something. Uh, that contradicts the established narrative, like mainstream narrative, it's much easier to kill your character rather than uh, rather than um, engage, uh, engage in a in a healthy debate and uh, try to prove your point. Yeah, so this is pretty much what's happening to Russia today. I think so. Uh, that's that's pretty much what's been happening to us. And uh, uh, speaking about the reasons for that, I think this is yeah, this is probably the fear of losing this monopoly. Of uh, of the information field, uh, fear of uh, competition, mm, and uh, things like that. To what extent do you think an anti-Russian sentiment plays into the the backlash against RT? That the sort of increasingly, as uh, people in Britain and America view uh, Putin's Russia as as an enemy once more, do you think this leads to? Does that fuel the pushback? Uh, I would think that uh, again, uh, this is a a complex subject because um, you see. I would say that any publicity is a good publicity. Yeah? So uh, anti-Russian anti uh, hysteria that we are witnessing now brings us to the forefront of uh, news uh, more often than uh, than we um, uh, than um, than we were uh, before. So, uh, but but uh, it has it has downsides as well because the climate, like the general climate that is uh, that is being built in uh, by the mainstream media. Uh, by uh, by this huge bubble of mainstream uh, mainstream media, uh, is so that um, that uh, some of my colleagues they have uh, they have been telling me recently that uh, they uh, have uh, tremendous pressure from the from peers from uh, from family members from uh, friends who are directly saying to them things like oh you're working for the enemy you know so and we didn't expect that this will reach this point at some stage you know so. Treating us as an enemy—that is something that we were, we are really surprised about. So uh, we we hope to just give the the alternative uh, views, yeah. And now we turn out to be the enemy. That's 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 not uh, how things should be, uh, should be should be going on in our opinion. 
I think that's also not what we expected because I think that, um, and uh, Nikolai is more familiar with this, I think on a personal level as somebody who was uh, at RT from the very beginning from 2005. But when RT was uh, starting up, uh, we were really looking at the likes of the CNN and the BBC uh, as models of how to do news, uh, as models of good journalism. And one of the things that we were hearing from, you know, for decades from Britain and the United States and specifically from those media is that uh, diversity of opinion is good, uh, diversity of voices is good. and so we really saw ourselves as uh, doing, in essence, a public service, as, again, agree with us or not, but we are contributing information. We are helping uh, educate the conversation. And instead, we got this pushback, uh, not just from the political circles, but from who we saw as our peers and even as our models in the media space, which was obviously hugely disappointing. On the other hand, it is, in a way, logical and understandable because no established anywhere likes to be challenged, especially if it's any kind of establishment that really controlled their sphere for uh, decades on end, as the, um, I'd say, largely uh, British and American media uh, have uh, for many years dominated the conversations around the world about the world. Uh, and, you know, far off corners believed their state of the world to be the way that they saw it from the channel that was thousands of miles away. And then uh, we come in and we, stop, we start sort of disrupting uh, that neat little world and saying, hey, uh, there's another side. And then what we're saying starts to resonate with people. People believe us not because you know, we've coerced them or we've brainwashed them. They believe us because what they see on RT is what they're seeing when they leave the house, is what they are seeing themselves in the world around them. And that, of course, undermines that control of the story uh, that the, you know, that what we refer to the establishment media and just the establishment circles have had. Um, and uh, that's when we get into this kind of very toxic uh, environment that we unfortunately are in right now with regards to, um, with regards to RT and Russia and that conversation. Actually, I, I, I don't know the figures for the UK. I uh, probably I should I should look them up. But uh, in the States, I, I was reading recently that that the level of uh, of public trust towards the media has dropped down to like twenty percent or something like that. So the only the only institution in the society that uh, that has uh, lower uh, ratings of trust are big business or something like that. And uh, so that 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 talks volumes about about um, about why um, so, so now now uh, we we see a different world you know so so there's no going back to the world where there is monopoly on truth uh, there is a monopoly on one opinion so there's there's no no going back to that you know so uh, there's uh, we are witnessing the emerging uh, the um, uh, uh, birth of a new world where there's going to be loads of loads of uh, sources of information and and um, trying to um, uh, to silence one of them is not a uh, is not a productive strategy. Sure. Great. I'd like to move on to some questions from the audience. So, if you have a question, please put your hand up. Let's go to the uh, front row right here. The gentleman in the crimson jumper. Thank you both for uh, coming and speaking to us this afternoon. Um, you, you mentioned uh, one of your anchors, one of the most famous faces here in the UK, George Galloway. In February of this year, Mr. Galloway called for, a, and I quote, a complete and total boycott of Israel and Israeli nationals. He also called for no Israeli academics to be invited to come and speak and debate their opinions at British universities. You said today that uh, you, you want to focus on maintaining a balance of views and on diversity of opinion. How do you, recognize, how do you reconcile those objectives with hiring and promoting Mr. Galloway? Thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I, I think I, I got the, the gist of, of the question, but I, I didn't hear the like every single word of it. But but I um, as for um, uh, yeah um, as for as for George, he's a uh, we. I, I don't think that uh, this is to be disputed that he's quite a personality. Yeah. So he's a um, he's a figure. He's a character. He's uh, he has a right to his opinions on, cer on certain subjects, yeah? Uh, so George is a uh, very directly speaking person and uh, he has an opinion. Some people can be offended by his views. Some people think that these views are 
they, they have right to exist and uh, some people share those views. So we don't have any trouble having George uh, on, uh, on RT because we have, on the other hand, we have different guests, different contributors who will, across our broadcast, sort of balance Galloway's views. And uh, so uh, we are absolutely, we, we don't have any trouble with, uh, with uh, George's views. And uh, he has, we think that he has an undeniable right to express them. Thank you. The next question, please. Yeah, if we look to go to the uh, hand there on the side right there. Also in the red jumper, <laughs> I believe. Hello, and again, thank you for uh, giving us this talk. Um, I'd like to ask you the que a question. First of all, you tend to frame an issue about differences of opinions. Nevertheless, there are some hard facts which RT seem to subscribe in a different world than the rest of the media. And also, you mentioned that establishment don't like to, uh, establishments don't like to be challenged. So how exactly does RT challenge the Russian establishment and promote a different view re um, in relation to the Russian establishment? Thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, one of the things that I said when talking about the foundation of us journalists is that uh, where is that facts are the foundation of the journalism uh, that we do. That while we embrace a diversity of opinion and stories and viewpoints, that uh, we, can, we really can't have journalism if we are going off uh, different foundation in terms of facts. However, I think that um, because of the dominance of certain voices in, uh, in the media for so long, um, they have come to regard their own opinion, um, purely opinion, their own subjective judgment uh, as fact uh, rather than the opinion that it is. Uh, one example that I will give is a uh, report uh, that was published, uh, I believe it was, by, uh, it was by NATO and then it was sort of their list of talking points and uh, it was picked up um, almost, uh, almost verbatim uh, by Reuters um, and, and regurgitated and obviously from there on went on to a lot of other media. And the report was something along the lines of the, um, you know, the uh, truth, the, the myths and, uh, you know, the facts versus myths about uh, NATO and Russia and things like that. And it critiqued obviously a lot of um, Russia's view on NATO. And in it, um, as fact versus fiction, it had items like NATO is, you know, fact, NATO is not a threat to Russia. Now, this is something that is uh, treated by NATO as fact, that is treated by the mainstream media as a fact, entirely invalidating the feelings, their concerns, the priorities of an entire nation. And I think that is where we have to be very careful that we are not uh, immediately ascribing as uh, this infallible uh, just kind of you know fact uh, status to anything that comes out of the uh, you know the pages or the screens or the mouths of the people that are on our side or representing somebody that we agree with um, that's uh, that's part one so um, you know we do want to live in the same objective reality as everybody else and that's why we do base our journalism um, on fact but beyond that we do want to explore the opinions and the sides of the story that go uncovered. That actually goes for Russia and how we uh, present Russia to the world. So what you need to understand about RT operation is that we're not a Russian national broadcaster. We are, um, you know, we are broadcasting to an audience of uh, millions of people in over 100 countries rather than to a domestic audience. And there the, Russian perspective is essentially an alternative perspective because it is going, um, it is the one that is missing an in-depth study and in-depth explanation, exploration in the, uh, on the global media stage. And that is how we try to complete the picture where it comes to Russian perspective uh, as well. That said, where it comes to uh, issues within Russia, which we do cover, um, we, sometimes have very critical, we oftentimes have very critical reporting of, of Russian issues. We conduct our own uh, investigations and publish pieces uh, that do very serious critique of, uh, of some of the policies. Most recently it has been, um, um, we did a whole series of reportage, for instance, of um, 
detentions, uh, very hard detentions that people were getting uh, for you know weeks on end for sharing or reposting some sort of you know problematic memes uh, or you know post on Twitter, on Facebook, on Vkontakte, and things like that. We've done it on issues of uh, corruption on all kinds of. Um, policies, whether it be um, pension reform or anything else. So it is there. I think that this idea that RT never airs uh, anything critical about Russia comes from uh, people not wanting to see it, because that in itself would undermine the narrative around RT uh, itself. Actually, may, may I just add uh, a little bit from, from, from the practical perspective, uh, uh, answering your question. Uh, we would like, uh, actually, we would like, uh, so that, that's not a problem for us, we would like to to um, attract more dissenting voices, uh, more voices that we can that we can debate uh, with, you know. But uh, lately, it's been very difficult. Uh, I'm I'm speaking about the UK. I'm I'm sure this is the same in uh, in other markets as well. That. Um, uh, I think I will not be mistaken if I say all the major parties in the UK uh, are not making a secret out of it, uh, so they are forbidding their members to appear on Russia Today. So it's like it's, <laughs> it's been the official policy of, uh, of all the major uh, UK parties that, uh, that the MPs should not be appearing on RT. Whether this helps a healthy debate or not, up to you to decide. Great. Moving on to the next question, please. Yeah, we'll go to the uh, lady here in the second row. Um, thank you for uh, your speeches and your replies so far. Um, so far, you have been painting the international reporting of RT <coughs> in terms of balancing the opinion of the world and the opinion of Russia. Um, and you have also said in terms of domestic reporting that people believe your reporting because they can see that it's true in their daily lives. Um, but is there not a concern about the potential monopoly of information that RT has over the Russian population in terms of painting the international community? RT does not broadcast in Russian, period. RT is an international broadcasting. It's imagine if the BBC broadcast in, you know, 10 different languages or 44 that it has websites, but did not broadcast in English. So, um, I'm, yeah, that's just not the space that we operate in. Mm -hmm. We, 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 have, yeah. we have a Russian service, yeah. We but, have a uh, Russian website, yeah. yeah. But also, you know, within Russia, there are uh, many TV channels, newspapers, some quite very, very oppositionally and critically minded within Russia, radio stations, um, um, and, and so on and so forth. So to say RT has a monopoly on... Well, it's, I mean, it, yeah. On and we're not... Russia, we're we're not. We're, <laughs> uh, besides, I, uh, I don't think that we are striving for monopoly, you know, like we, we are absolutely happy with the existence of other, uh, other sources of information. That's not, that's not something that we would, uh, we would really try to... So we, we're, not, we're not like an, a huge uh, like media empire that wants to, like, I don't know, that wants to crack down on all the other sources of information and uh, monopolize the discourse. No, 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 that's, that's, that's a totally wrong strategy, you know. So, as, as I said before, there's no going back to one source uh, of information world. So, there's, there's, uh, so the world is moving towards, towards uh, different sources of information and there's, you, you, you can fight it, you can, you can accept it, but uh, that's, that's the way, way it is, you know. So, it's, it's where the world is moving, you cannot do anything about that. Forgive me for following up, but I'm just slightly interested by the way you present RT as totally separate from Russian language and Russian domestic broadcasting. Given that I believe that Margarita served as the editor in chief of both RT, you know, obviously an international English language broadcaster, as well as, uh, forgive my pronunciation, Rosaya Segdonaya, yeah, uh, a I Russian see language someone, yeah. domestic channel. So Not a channel. It's a news agency um, and a digital portal. So, no TV, under her purview, there's no Russian language TV news channel, period. But isn't RT owned by a Russian state-sponsored news network? No. RT Novosti? No, no we're, not part, we're not owned by Rio Novosti, or by now Mia Rasiya Sivodnya. We're not. We're an entirely separate organization. Okay. So you think there's no connection at all between uh, RT as an international broadcaster and the broadcasts of its commercial and financial affiliates that are focusing on the Russian market? But you, who do you mean by commer commercial and well, the, the, the Russian language branches yeah. that are, have so similar editors, yeah. similar funders? Yeah, it's similar probably. I, I, I think I think I, I know what uh, what what you mean. Uh, we uh, 
So, uh, so probably you're talking about, so, so there's, there's, uh, there's a great deal of misunderstanding about uh, RT, Russia Today, Russia Сегодня, which translates as Russia Today Which we're partly well. involved for so, that, yes. <laughs> so, and, and, and uh, having Margarita Simonian, our editor-in-chief, uh, um, also working as editor-in-chief for Russia Сегодня, which translates as Russia Today, but not, not us, not a TV station. It's a, uh, it, it doesn't add, um, it, it doesn't help uh, to, to clarify things. So basically what, um, what you're talking about is we, we, have, we have a channel, uh, a family of channels that's called RT. It used to be called Russia Today, but then we shortened it, so now we are called RT, and it, uh, it, uh, it is comprised of uh, six uh, languages, or how many languages do we have now? Uh, four for television, four, and yeah. six overall, including, uh, so it's uh, yeah. English, uh, English, Arabic, Spanish, mm -hmm. and French on TV, mm -hmm. plus uh, digital platforms also in Russian mm -hmm. and in German. So, so it's a public broadcaster, yeah, and, uh, uh, and there's also a uh, news agency, uh, it's called Russia Сегодня in uh, Russian, which translates as Russia Today. And when you translate it as Russia Today, sometimes people will confuse us and them, you know, whereas we are totally separate entities. But again, Margarita Simonian is editor-in-chief in both uh, RT, uh, the family of channels, and the uh, Russia Сегодня agency, which is a different organization. We, of course, we, we have, uh, we, have uh, we, we use their materials sometimes, yeah, because we are subscribed to their, uh, to, their uh, uh, to their wires, to their pictures. But uh, other than that, I would say we are competing probably against each other. On well, the digital platforms probably, yeah. probably are. But also, I think, to, and then again, uh, I don't speak, and neither does Nikola, for, the, for anything that is uh, Russia Sibonia related, because again, aside from editor-in-chief, they're entirely different structures. They're entirely different organizationally. Um, uh, and in terms of the, the funding structure, all of these things. But um, we are, um, you know, we are, let's say, a B2C um, operation. You know, we go straight to the audience. Rasia Sivodnya is, uh, and this is just kind of a general, general education moment, Rasia Sivodnya is, there are really two sides to it. There is the um, wire service, and then there is the Sputnik brand within, uh, within it that does, um, that has, uh, digital platforms in 30 languages. So the wire service is in Russian and the wire service really is primarily a B2B operation. So it doesn't have, you know, and it's one of the three major Ru uh, Russian language wire services that exist within Russia. It's not a broadcaster, not radio, not television. Um, you know, it would be akin to um, Thomson Reuters or something like that. That's the space um, that they operate in. Sorry about that. I mean, this, yeah. but, but this is this is vital for understanding that because uh, because you see sometimes in the news that the people often mix up uh, mix us up with uh, with Russia Sivodnya, whereas uh, and uh, say uh, um, they uh, they would accuse us of, of things that we didn't do, and so it's that that I, I understand that it's a little bit tricky. But uh, yeah, once you get a little bit. F uh, it took about a year for people to even understand that there are two <laughs> different structures. So as somebody who headed up RT Press office, there was a lot of that kind of very repeated, repetitive emails that I've sent in my time of saying, no, 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 let's give the breakdown of how it works. And yes, but the names aren't helping. Great. Well, I think that's a good note to end on and conclude on. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for really having us. Time here in Oxford. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.